Hello, I'm Alex Pierre from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to share this. Um, in this work, we attempt to personalize rendering to mitigate distance misperception in virtual reality. It's well established that distances can be misperceived when viewing virtual environments. In a head-mounted display, you would expect things to seem too close. Uh, when experiencing this effect, if you were to view a target in a virtual scene, you would perceive it to be at a different distance than intended. On average, by closer by 26%. Back in 2016, we thought, hey, if things are too close, let's push them forward so that too close is now in the right place. We did this by using a vertex shader to move things in the scene by what we called a warp <coughs> multiplier. An example of various multipliers are depicted here. We were surprised to find that a multiplier that rendered space 30% further away resulted in a, in a change of only about half that in distances perceived by viewers in aggregate. We also had each participant try a range of warps. Regression lines here show linear fits are the results, and the axis show the ideal warp these fits suggest. Um, each color is a different participant. Uh, it would seemed that each person had a different ideal warp. In the current work, we attempt to create these personalized warps. We ask participants to provide distance estimates across a range of distances, and then use a linear regression to generate the warp parameters that should, in theory, correct for distance misperception. We measure perceived distance using a blind throwing task. Participants view a target, and then close their eyes and throw a beanbag towards it. The difference between where the beanbag lands and the intended target is taken to be the error in perceived distance. As there is some error when people perform this task viewing real targets, and we're interested in the effect of viewing targets in VR, uh, we subtract the average real environment error from the virtual environment perceived distance estimates to get what we call relative perceived distance. Here you see a participant's relative perceived distance estimates across a range of target distances. The black line shows the ideal performance. Uh, this participant showed underestimation at longer distances. The red line shows a regression over these estimates with an intercept fixed at zero. The inverse of the slope of this line corresponds to the warp multiplier that would correct the observed distance misperception. Multiplying the existing measures by this multiplier and running a regression on the results, we see that the corrected line in green runs directly atop the ideal line. In theory, this would completely correct the observed error. We also tried a regression with a free intercept. This yields two parameters for the warp. Uh, we use the inverse of the slope again for a multiplier and subtract uh, the intercept from the camera's position, moving it backwards by that offset. In theory, this should also correct for the misperception. We call the parameter derived from the regression slope A. We call the parameter derived from the intercept B. Using the intercept fixed at zero yields only an A parameter, so we call this warp A. And using a free intercept, warp AB. We would expect them both to perform similarly. We tested these techniques with 12 participants. Uh, they first threw to targets viewed in a real environment, and then in an unmodified virtual environment. After the warp parameters were generated, participants threw to targets viewed in a virtual environment, modified using the two warp methods and their personalized warp parameters. There was a clear difference between the real and unmodified virtual trials, indicating that distances were misperceived as expected. We prefer to define distance misperception error as the difference between the real and virtual performance. So for most of our analysis, we observe percent error relative to the real environment performance, called here relative percent error. Warp A improves misperception, but doesn't eliminate it completely, only by about half. Warp AB does not improve things, rather it seems to cause an overestimation a greater than the initial underestimation. Uh, distance also had a significant influence. But warp A was progressively worse as distances increased. Warp AB was much worse at two meters than at three or four. Overall, we see much less distance misperception than expected. At two meters, the no warp condition sees negligible error. 
as does warp A, uh, which may have biased the regression for distances that, di that did see error. These effects suggest warps uh, that are nonlinear, perhaps piecewise linear, uh, across distance might be needed. Here's a summary of the warp parameters selected. Uh, we'd hope that B might correct for misaligned eye depth, uh, something on the order of a few centimeters. Instead, we see a mean of 34 centimeters. Uh, warp AB, then, becomes an example of what happens under a kind of extreme warp. Correcting distance misperception for a single task may not correct it for all tasks, uh, particularly those that depend on other depth cues or that afford other means of interaction. Extreme warps, in particular, may introduce disruptive uh, distortions. We use a blind directed action task, blind throwing, to calibrate our warp parameters. We observe the effects of our warp method on two additional different kinds of tasks. In the planks task, participants are asked to tilt an invisible plane with planks attached, uh, with the goal of making the plane parallel to the ground. Sloped ground has been shown to influence depth estimates, so it follows that depth misperception might influence perception of slope. Participants view a plane given a random tilt and are able to pull with a track controller to adjust the tilt of the planks up or down. The goal is to make the plane be parallel to the ground. Error in this task is measured in degrees tilted away from being level with the ground. Uh, no significant influence is found for either warp method. Uh, trend is present, with error increasing as warp methods become more extreme. However, the error becomes more negative which is the opposite direction we expect with the distance overestimation we saw with warp AB. In the other task, the cube task, participants are asked to reshape a rectangular box such that all sides are the same size to make it a cube. Participants are allowed to freely walk around the box and are able to adjust the size of two of the size, sides. <clears throat> a one dimension size is held fixed. The participant's goal is to adjust the other two sides to match. Error here is the sum of square differences in meters between each of the two adjustable dimensions and the fixed dimension they were to match. Uh, warp A does not seem to influence this task. Warp AB is significantly different from the warp A case, but not the no warp case. It looks like warp AB may influence this task, but certainly not to the magnitude that it influenced blind throwing. In conclusion, warp A did reduce misperception, but not as much as expected. The two additional tasks were not strongly affected by warp, which is particularly surprising in the AB case. The two warps appear to behave differently by distance. This may imply that a nonlinear piecewise warp may, could be used. Uh, it's also odd that we saw so little distance compression in general, particularly the two meter distance. In a previous study using a similar setup over the same distances with no warp, we saw a mean RPE of 18%, here just seven. For the future, um, we did not counterbalance presentation order of task or warp method here deliberately, uh, but there may have been an, an order effect. It might be worth observing additional tasks using the between subjects designed to isolate the individual conditions to be sure. We saw a fairly strong distance effect on misperception in the percent error space. Uh, neither, neither linear warp method entirely mitigated the observed distance compression at any distance, um, but a nonlinear warp method might. Finally, it would it would be nice if someone wearing an HMD could, ca could uh, calibrate this sort of adjustment quickly and without having someone around to make measurements and pick up beanbags for them. Um, so blind throwing is not fast and involves picking up a lot of beanbags. Um, actively looking for other perceived distance measures that would allow people to perform this uh, without supervision uh, and uh, much faster. That would open up a lot. Uh, uh, experiments that depend on larger samples both in uh, individual participants and in measures per participant.
and that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, one question, thanks. Uh, did you consider working on disparity space instead of absolute distance? Because usually the depth resolution that you have, it depends on the disparity. So one pixel, if you're close, will give, have a small effect on the depth, whereas if you're far away, one pixel will have a strong effect. So maybe this is one nonlinear warping that you can consider, just one over Z. Mm. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, what we're doing right now is uh, positioning things in world space, applying the multiplier, and then taking it back out of world space, and then to allow the rest of the, uh, the to go through the perspective transform and everything. Um, it's a possibility that becomes something like a log transform, maybe? It's one over Z, just. Well, yeah. yeah. Hi, Paulo Figueroa, University of Los Andes in Colombia. I was wondering in the cube experiment if you counterbalance the dimensions that you are changing. I wonder if it's the same trying to fix the X, Y, or Z dimensions. Uh, so they were wholly random for this one. Okay. Um, that's a thing that we might look at uh, in the post analysis to make sure that there wasn't an influence. I haven't done that yet. Um, okay. uh, what sort of influence would you be worried about? I, I was wondering if it's just easier to, to get some idea of the dimension in the x hmm. uh, direction than in the y or in the z. It, it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of any. I didn't see anyone developing that strategy, I'll say. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Sorry, I'm Vaughan Power from the University of Portsmouth. Um, very interested in the latter two studies. have some slight concern about the first one with the beanbags. Uh, I may have missed it. Is there, was there a control stage where you got people used, used to the adaptation of throwing a beanbag in that distance in non-VR and VR? Well, obviously, it's a non-aerodynamic object. Not everyone's familiar with throwing a beanbag at a set distance. Well, so this is, uh, this is an established distance measure that people yeah. are sort of already good at in theory. They were allowed to practice in the real environment um, to distances not used uh, explicitly within the experiment. Um, Did you also do a control in VR as well though? So I'm not sure what you mean by control in VR. So, that, no, that, so that it's a blind test, they're not given feedback. Yeah, but bef beforehand to get them adapted to the environment when they're throwing the beanbag in a real-world environment, hmm. they've got a set distance they're looking at. Did you give them distance markers in VR to throw so, the beanbag? So no, we explicitly cannot do that because if they adapt to the VR space, um, they will learn to throw to those distances. Uh, okay. And then, it, then if you do a blind task in the real world afterwards, uh, they'll overestimate if they were going to underestimate in, in VR. Okay. So. We're trying to explicitly avoid adaptation. Okay, thank you.